Good morning, Giants. Welcome to the park bench. I'm Nick Smith. We've got Johnny B. Good on the line with us. So John, John Brooks out of Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, just a reminder for the show, if you haven't subscribed to YouTube, make sure you go on and do that. Uh, we've got hundreds of videos on there that are all helpful in your Giants journey. The park bench is a little different, though. We don't have an intro video yet. We might down the road. But um, in, in the park bench, it's we're just going to talk. It's just me and John. And so I'm going to ignore the comments. You guys, please comment and share your thoughts as we go through this. Uh, but we'll come back to those after the show. And that way, John and I can focus. So, John, welcome to the park bench. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. What uh, what had you come on here? What had you decide to say yes to this? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I watch you guys. You know, I mean, I know I don't really, I guess, participate too much. I try to comment here and there. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I seen you guys were going to do the park bench again. And I was like, you know, that'd be great to get on and, you know, and just sit down and chat. And, you know, I know the first time that we got together, um, I think you told me at that point, my video was one of the most viewed that you've ever done, which was shocking to me because, you know, I don't think I'm that big a person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I figured, well, let's try it again. You know, I mean, let's sit down yeah. and have a chat and see if we can inspire and motivate people or, you know, just share stories. And yeah, so. I, I want to take it in whatever direction you want to go. We can coach, we can talk. I mean, do you have some thoughts about what's on your mind and where you I can mean, right? Yeah, yeah, right now, I mean, there's, I mean, like everybody else in the world, I mean, everything's going crazy. So, you know, just trying to navigate through the world today and, you know, like everybody else, it's tough. I'm, I'm fortunate. I did find a job, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, still planning on moving out of Las Vegas um, because of what happened, you know, in the world. I was almost pretty much like a day away from moving to the Midwest. And, yeah, you know, fortunately, I found a job here and ended up staying here for a little while longer. But my plan is still to get out of Las Vegas. So yeah, so navigating. Let's talk about that. Let's just dive down that rabbit hole a little bit. So navigating. Okay. Would you say the uncertainty, the uh, the climate, like what? Uh, what yeah, do you I mean, mean just everything. You know, I mean, everything's so uncertain. You know, what's going to happen? You know, what decisions are going to be made? Yeah, um, you know, there's still a lot a lot of people out of work um i know in the industry that i'm in we're seeing a lot of bog down in production because people they haven't found people to come back to work so we're not getting shipments and yeah. shipments are taking longer so you know navigating just you know through life and trying to anticipate what's going to happen and not really you know buying into uh you know any uh, conspiracies or, 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 you know, just trying to forecast what's going to happen, you know, and trying to make yeah. the best decisions for our families. And, you know, I mean, like I said, I was like a day away from, from leaving Las Vegas and it was scary. You know I mean? I had to pick, I had to sell my house, um, you know, find a place where I was going. Luckily where I was going, I do have some family. So that was fortunate for me to help me out. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it was scary, you know, just to like so quickly, like a whirlwind, just pick up and be like, okay, I got to go. I mean, I did find a job where I was going. That's why I was leaving. Yeah. Yeah. You know? so, let's, let's talk about that. So instead of generalizing it, putting it out here of, you know, our families and, and us as a whole, let's talk about John. Let's, let's go into your world and that fear that you felt. So when you say uncertainty, when you're going into that space of not knowing what the future is going to hold, what happens to you? Where do you go? Well, it's tough. You know, I mean, I was always taught to, you know, not show emotion, you know, as a kid, you know, I grew okay. up kind of old school, uh, yeah. raised by my grandparents mostly. And, you know, my grandfather uh, was a very prominent man where we're from. And uh, he just taught me to be a tough guy, you know, and not show emotion, not cry about things and, you know, just get it done and work hard. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, you get to a point where you're just like, can it stop? You know, can can I not have this anxiety or, or, yeah. uh, you know, I'm not sure what else, how to say it, but you know, just the uncertainty of your life, you know, it's like a lot of things we take for granted, you know, and it's like all of a sudden, boom, we're yeah. all faced with this uncertainty of like, where's our next check going to come from? You know, how are we going to pay our bills? And, right. You know, and that was my concern was, you know, my two grown kids moved back home because of the pandemic. So I'm worried about them, even though they're adults. I mean, they're still my children. You know, and I'm like worried about them, like, you know, how can I keep this house and, you know, make sure there's a roof over my family's head, you know, my girlfriend, my stepson, 
So it was tough, you know, and then the decision to, you know, to move cross country, I mean, to Michigan, that's where I was going. Yeah. You know, originally, that's where I'm from. Uh, have family there and you know i figured if i was gonna move i might as well move somewhere where i have family and, and right it's just facing those decisions you know when i've kind of i don't want to say set roots but i mean i've planted myself here in las vegas you know i've been here eight years or so and and you know to just all of a sudden one day boom i gotta move because mm. i can't find a job here you know? Yeah, let me let me uh, pull some things in so in your family there's this this bit of stoicism right? You, you just suck it up. Yeah. And, but inside of you, there's this anxiety that's going on. Like it's happening, whether you suck it up or not. And so there's this, um, I would almost say what I'm hearing is a sense of control. You know, I got to make sure this is okay. I got to make sure this person's okay. And that person's okay. And I got to make sure this outcome happens. And, and, and so there's this sense of control, which comes from that anxiety. It's, it's our way of regaining certainty. But the challenge is that there's no certainty in that control. It's an illusion of certainty. Exactly. And so the the future is still unknown, but we're sitting there doing things to feel control. And and it's it's not affecting out here. And so you're still feeling this anxiety, but you got to put on the show that I'm tough, I'm okay, nobody can know. So you're fighting this battle alone. Yeah. Exactly. Does that sound accurate? It's exactly accurate. I mean. It's like they, you know, it's like you hear, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. A lot of people look like they've got it in control, but inside they're hiding all this anxiety and, and you know, yeah. turmoil that they're going through because they don't know what to do. They're trying to make it happen. And, you know, like I said, I was just trying to make sure my family was okay and that we had a place to live. And, you know, it's like, yeah, it's just tough, you know, I mean, and my family doesn't know because I hide it from them, you know, and, and and it's tough because you want to let your family in so they know who you are. But at the same time, you want to know, want them yeah. to know that you're taking care of things, man. So so there's uh, if I were to use the word tolerance keeps coming to mind, you know, there's zero tolerance for uncertainty. There's zero tolerance for feeling weak and insecure. There's zero tolerance for that. So. Like you said, people have this cover and there's a lot of good looking covers out oh, there, yeah. right? But then you'd <laughs> I, I'd, I'd have to venture and say I have a pretty good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and somebody from the outside would have no clue mm -hmm. what's going on inside of you. And so I think, you know, if we dive down the pathways of uncertainty and acceptance, let me let me kind of tie in. I'm going to pull some stuff in and then you you just go with it wherever it goes for you. But when I teach the 12 journeys out of the book, the giants and the smalls, um, the first journey is unconsciousness. Like when you're unconscious, there's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. The challenge here, John, is that you're so conscious of how you show up that you're ruminating around that. So it, it just stays in there. So you have awareness. That's the second journey, right? And then it goes into guilt or uh, grief. Because when you go into grief, it's not just loss. Uh, grief is a, a useful tool, I think, because it puts you into that state of, it can put you into a state of depression and depression will make you feel, it'll make you retreat. It'll make you reflect on what's going on and ruminate. It'll put you into reality. It'll give you some, some reverence. It actually brings you down and humbles you a bit. So you start to have compassion and empathy for others. And, and then the step that people miss is the re-engagement. So, you got to re-engage with life. And so depression is kind of meant to do that. So it gets us to stop putting energy at things. So I want you to hear as I go through these kind of where you're at in your journey as you're looking at anxiety. So you go through grief and then you go to acceptance. Acceptance just means it is what it is. So the journey of acceptance, it is what it is. It doesn't mean you love it. it doesn't mean you agree with it. it just that's reality. Exactly. And, and it's okay. Like reality says, Johnny's anxious and he's anxious. Do you want me to call you Johnny or John? No, you just call me John. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so the reality is you're anxious. So you go through yeah. this awareness that you're anxious and then maybe that grief and depression around being anxious and then acceptance of being anxious. And then there's gratitude that comes out of that. And then you go into uncertainty. So the, the journey of uncertainty is where there's the most possibility. And so, when you can be at peace with what is, you start to explore what's possible. And I think what happens is we want to explore what's possible from what we can count on, what we think is certain. 
And so that's where we try and control out in front of us. It's like a safety net. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. You know, as long as we know that this is going to happen, then we're okay with it. But when it's uncertain, we become fearful and, and yeah. scared to, to go forward. And we got to try to, you know, not be fearful and just go with it and, and well, know, and just have faith, you know, have yeah. faith that it's all going to work out. And, you know, and that's what I've tried to do. You know, I've, I've, I've been scared. I mean, but like a lot of people don't see that I'm scared that, you know, where we're going, what we're headed to, is, you know, but I make it look like I'm in control, but inside I'm like, Oh man, I hope this works out. I'm you know? spun <laughs> up. Right. Like, yeah. 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 If they only knew what was going on in here. Oh. <laughs> yeah. They don't want to tell know. me, tell me what came <laughs> up. <laughs> oh man. Like, isn't that interesting? What came yeah. up? Yeah. I mean, just everything. I mean, it's like, yeah. um, uh, my mind works super fast, even yeah. at my old age. Um, and I kind of attribute that to, you know, I was diagnosed with ADD back in, you know, the late seventies, early eighties. And yeah. it just, my mind just moves so fast. So, I mean, I just think of tons of things in splits of seconds and, and it just like, when you said that, it just, just everything flashed before me, like, you know, my family and, you know, where we are today and where we're going. And, and yeah. just in that split second, I thought about all those things in depth you know? So, okay. Let's let, that's so interesting. I want to, I want to highlight this, you know, that's what I want to do is highlight things. So, um, people say when you die, your life flashes before your eyes, but yeah. just before you're discovered as well, your life flashes before your eyes is like, if people knew what was going on inside of me, man, your whole life spins through and you're like, Oh shit, they would know all this stuff about me. Yeah. 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 And you know, sometimes we have to be vulnerable and, and let ourselves out there. Everybody's human. We all make mistakes. You know, mm -hmm. we all make bad decisions. And, you know, I've made my fair share. And the thing is, is just, you know, take, um, you know, take responsibility for it, own it, you know, and learn from it. That's the biggest thing is learn from those mistakes. And that's what I've tried to do. And that's what I've tried to teach my kids is you're going to make mistakes to the day, you know, you go into the earth and into the heaven. And, you know, I said, but own it, be, you know, a good person and learn from it and move on and, and just make yourself that much better from learning from those mistakes. So you don't do it again. I love you know? that. And so yeah, go ahead. Did you have, no, more? I was just going to say, yeah. and that's what I try to do, you know, is yeah. learn from those mistakes and, and try not to make mistakes, but we're going to make mistakes and we can't be fearful for that. So, okay. And, and what if you are fearful and what um, if you can make mistakes and, and you are fearful and, you know, I, let's play with this for a minute. Okay. So, so the idea of mistakes, we, we label it, we put a judgment on it, that it's a mistake. And, you know, and there's some things, some outcomes that may need some cleaning up, right? Some things that we've done and, and we may have to go back and, and face those and clean them up. Right. Right. And so there's some learning in it. And, right. and um, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying, and you can help guide me in this. Sure is that when things happen in your world that get a little messy, there's some cleaning up to do and owning it is meaning that when you do that, you do what it takes to clean it up. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think what happens is, and I've seen this myself and a lot of people, they make mistakes or they get themselves in a situation and they kind of wallow in that mm. and, and they focus on what has happened instead of, trying to find a solution or to move on. And that's why when people say, Oh, why is this happened to me? Or why am I still in this rut? I'm like, because you're still wallowing in the situation mm -hmm. that happened. Yeah. And you're not trying to find a solution or to make it better. You haven't learned anything from what you're in, hmm. you know, so you can move forward. I mean, I've been there in my lifetime quite a few times and yeah. you know, I've seen other people where, you know, they just, they kind of wallow, in that situation or that bad decision or, or whatever. And I don't know if it's fear or yeah. what I would, I would say, yes. Yeah. Let, let's look at that because when you're talking about uncertainty, let's put that on a plane here. Mm -hmm. Right. And then a person mm -hmm. comes up to uncertainty. So they bump up against it and there's the plane of uncertainty and they don't know what to expect in the future. And they're caught in between where they, they could go and where they've been. 
-hmm. And so everything that they remember is from the past. So they bring that into the present and they have this, what's called it and research wise is called the remembered presence. Right. And so in that wallowing and that staying stuck in that cycle, they just spin up and they pause right there and they don't re-engage and mm -hmm. the opportunity for growth, the biggest changes in your life are going to come from that uncertainty. Yeah. But staying in the wallowing means that you're not re-engaging. And that's where a lot of people miss when it comes to anxiety, when it mm -hmm. comes to depression, one of the vital steps, loss of any kind is to re-engage. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you're ignoring what happened. It's that that re-engagement brings everything back online. And so a lot of times when you're stuck in that fear cycle, you're your brain is going to shut down your, your functions for cognitive thinking are going to shut down. And so you're going to be in survival mode. Yeah. And re-engagement exactly. helps pull you out. What comes up as you hear that? Um, what came up was when I lost my brother, you know, back in 2006, um, you know, I got stuck in that wallow. I got stuck in that kind of infinite circle. Hmm. Um, it took me down some dark paths. I didn't know, you know, my future, I thought my future was over. You know, because we all, you know, when we have loved ones, we we always dream of growing older with those loved ones. Hmm. And when you lose somebody that close to you, you know, your future, your image of your future just kind of goes poof and it's gone. OK. And, you know, I went down some dark roads and, and I finally and like you said, I finally found a way to get out of that infinite circle of, of the wallow and reengage in in life and in society and. I did it in a positive manner. It's kind of what projected me to get to where I am today is just to be yeah. keep being positive. I mean, I hear that with your the loss of your brother. Then you're really close to him and he's gone. Mm -hmm. And I would I would imagine, and you can help me with this too, that there would be this wanting to remember not only your brother, but the good times and to reflect, which mm -hmm. would seem normal in grief and loss is to reflect. And I don't know if, if people get stuck in that cycle of just reflection and, and they're unable to move forward because they're just they're They don't want to lose that potentially. Can you help me with that? Um, I think for me, it wasn't so much of that. It was just uh, a lot of it for me was anger, um, hmm. you know, because of the loss of my brother and, you know, and the pain and the hurt of hmm. losing a loved one. And so for me, it was, it was more angry, you know, that my brother was gone and, and now my whole life has changed, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, it wasn't holding on to the memories. The memories are what kept me going, you know, mm -hmm. and helping me break out of that cycle, that wallow, you know, and, and just remembering the good times that I had, you know, it's like I was staying so focused on his passing that it kept me in that wallow, that circle, that infinite circle. And then you know, as days went by and it took me a while. I mean, it was like a good, probably almost two years before I broke out of it. Hmm. And uh, once I did, it was just, I remember, you know, the good times we had growing up, you know, it's like, you know, it's like your whole life just kind of going through and yeah, yeah. You know, when we were young to when we were young adults, you know, we both had children, we both hung out and had our kids play together, you know? So just remembering all that kind of helped me keep moving forward. And it still does today, you know? Hmm. So, so it's, yeah, it's let still, me. It's still painful to this day, but I remember those good times. So. I'm, I'm going to do some confirmation bias here because I have some thoughts about what's what's going on. Uh, and and the challenge with confirmation bias is when we're doing searches and we're looking out into the world, we're looking for confirmation of our views and beliefs. Okay, so as I share this, I see some things that I see as truths, and in this, you might see some things that ring true for you, but you might have some additional thoughts that I'm not seeing. So help me with that. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So when we go through a loss, uh, there's a shattering, right? This is Susan Anderson's work. There's a shattering. And then we withdraw, we pull back, which is pretty normal. And then we internalize and then we rage and mm -hmm. anger. Like you mentioned, anger is pretty natural part of the grieving process. And then the final step for her was lifting. In depression, when they do uh, grief grief research of people at the end of their lives, they go through denial, uh, they go through anger, they go through bargaining, they go through depression, and then they go to acceptance. Like they just accept it. And it's interesting that when you go to acceptance, you, you have this peace with what is. And it's like it is what it is. And then you're able to there, 
if we go to Susan Anderson's work to lift, mm -hmm. to re-engage. And so there, there wouldn't be much confirmation bias there because there's research that's been done that shows that that's what people do when, the, when they're grieving a loss of any form. It doesn't matter if it's death, a job, a relationship, um, an ideal. You could even have the loss of a, a dream or a vision, and that would run you through the same cycle. And so when people get stuck in that spin up, that world, that, uh, what is it? That wallowing, right? Yeah. Um, they don't lift, they don't re-engage, they don't accept what is. And so therefore what I imagine happens is they just, they don't ever reach that peace with what happened. And until they reach that peace with what is, it's really hard to move into the unknown because the future is unwritten at that point in their mind. Right. Right. Yeah, and that's exactly. Yeah, and that's. I think that's pretty spot on. You know, especially you know, looking back at what I went through and went through almost this exact same thing. You know, the anger, and then yeah. once I was able to find, you know, to accept it and find my peace, and that's what kind of propelled me out of that kind of dark situation I was in. And then I was able to enlighten everybody around me. Like I accepted it, and then I moved. Like I said, I moved into a a more positive atmosphere. Yeah. And yeah. I used it to uplift people to, you know, to uh, just kind of motivate and inspire people. And that's the kind of the route I took. But, you know, some people, they kind of take the opposite, you know, route yeah. and yeah. they just are kind of still kind of dark and angry, Real angry, right? Yeah, they, get, so. they get stuck there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want you to hear this not only for that experience, but for your future. Okay is that as you're stepping into the uncertainty, let me just kind of go through the certainty cycle with you and how that happens, how I see it as happening, is we have this idea or inspiration and, and we want to trust it. We want to step into it in some form. So we have this faith and we step into it and we, we really step into a space of not knowing. We don't know how it's going to turn out. We're speculating. And so we go into that unknown and we start stepping. And as we step, we adjust. And then we gain what's called a sense of certainty. And when you're comfortable with Vegas, you know, Vegas has slot machines. They used to put quarters in them. Now they're yeah. debit cards and credit cards. Right. <laughs> a lot easier, right? Yeah. Um, a sense of certainty gives us the idea that something will happen, even though we haven't tested it enough to say that that's going to be the case. So it would be like somebody putting a quarter in a slot machine, pulling the handle and, and winning the jackpot on their first quarter ever. Right. They would say with a sense of certainty that if they put a quarter in the slot machine, they're going to win the jackpot every time. Well, we know from testing, that's just not true. Right. Yeah. So people operate from possibility, not probability. Mm -hmm. And so as you keep stepping, you start leaning more into probability and certainty. And we go from impossible, like Christopher, I think it was Christopher Reeves said, you go from impossible to probable to inevitable in your mm -hmm. dreams. And so we move into this cycle where we go to certainty, where we know we can count on something. And, uh, and then we have knowing around that knowledge around the things that we can count on, like the sun coming up. So we have certainty that the sun will come up. We can count on it. We have right. people in our lives that we can count on when they say they'll do something, it happens. And so we count on them. We trust them. Um, and then we, we gain wisdom around that, like how to use that. And that becomes our truth and the foundation for our operation. And then from there, we teach. Sometimes we inspire, like you put out your quotes and, and those inspire and somebody else goes through that cycle again. Mm -hmm. So with, with uncertainty, there's always going to be or likely going to be this unknown, right? But all of our creations are going to happen in that space of unknowing. Like, yeah. If I were to ask you to predict perfectly your day tomorrow, <laughs> you would try and give me some kind of a, an idea of what it would be like. Right. But the truth is that tomorrow could be completely different from that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Some, yeah I yeah. mean, the thing is, is tomorrow. I mean, if you try to predict, like you said, say like tomorrow, like, and you have a plan, like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this, 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 and this. But what we don't realize is, we could start out and the plan could be going great. And then there's one thing yeah. that could be interjected in our day that could basically take us on a different journey. You know, we had this plan and, and we were going to do all these different things in that day. 
But one thing, either an interaction with somebody, um, you know, a weather change. I mean, who knows what what it would could it it could be, and it'll set you on another path, which then takes you on a paradigm where you know your whole future changes. So now you're on a different path. And, and, yeah, yeah, and the yeah. wonderful thing about life is the future is for us to create. And yeah, even beautiful. though we have this idea of what it could be, it changes every second, every day, every minute. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the anxiety, right. The idea of anxiety. Um, <clears throat> I, I got a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder back in 2000, 2017. So a few years back, um, doesn't affect me today. I've learned right. some tools. I'm not on medication for it. Some people are, and it works. It helps them yeah. calm down so they can work through it. Um, but what I found is that when we have the anxiety, you're going to have a chemical reaction. Your body's mm -hmm. designed for it. Whenever there's fear present or potentially present, we're going to go through that fight or flight cycle. And that adrenaline is going to rush and your brain's going to shut down. You're going to get prepared to survive. And we live in a, a time where there's constant triggers of fear. Yes. You know, there's a virus, there's a war, there's a economic downturn, there's a job loss, there's this, you know, somebody died over here. And, and, and so we're constantly presented with these triggers of fear that keep us in that state of closure. Mm -hmm. And so exactly. what I've learned through all of this, um, one of the principles I teach is salmonic action is the salmon in water, no matter how rough the water is, it can sit perfectly still. Right. And then at the moment of opportunity, it shoots upstream at lightning speed. And so in our world where the world feels chaotic and is flowing around us, our job is to just hold firm and then look for opportunities. So when everybody was shutting down in 2020, Ryan and I moved forward with the book. Yeah. Right. And it was yep. great. The timing was perfect because everybody's going this way yep. with fear. We were looking for opportunities. And so anxiety, if if you don't learn to, to manage it, will run you downstream. Mm -hmm. So even a dead fish can swim downstream. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. So what yeah. comes up as you hear that? Um, you know, just as you know, don't be don't. I don't want to say don't fear, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the things you can't control, you can't worry about. You can only worry about the things you can control, and especially in this in this world where everything's ever changing, and and a lot of things we don't have control of. You know, yeah, you know, uh, being quarantined or or you know lockdowns or whatever. But like you guys did, you know, it's an opportunity for us to kind of reinvent ourselves or to do the things that we always wanted to do, but always said we didn't have time. Well, guess what? Now you have time. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we're locked down, ain't nobody going nowhere. So. Yeah. So what happens when you fight? What is? Uh, I mean, when you try to control things that you don't have control, um, I don't, I don't, my personal opinion is I don't think you get anywhere. I think you're just okay. fighting an uphill battle that you don't make any progress on because you can't control certain things. Um, you know, there may be an, uh, an instance, I don't want to say never, but you know, maybe there might be an instance where you might get a step or two yeah. moving forward in some of the things you can't control. Cause maybe you convince someone or something to do a certain yeah. thing. But, but I think ultimately, I think if we focus on things we can't control, you know, it, it'll build the anxiety and, you know, yeah. the fear, because it's like, you're just, you're stagnant. You're just sitting there. You know, you're still putting all this energy and trying to do something, but you're not going nowhere. And I always tell people, I said, don't worry about the things you can't control. Worry about the things you can control. Yeah. The things so you can't control, you can make progress on. Let's let's look at that. That word control, as I hear that word, um, it sounds really rigid to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's like it has to be a certain way, a right. control, right? right? Like it's manipulated in a way. Mm -hmm. Um I look at at um, what is in the world, and one of the things, even having anxiety, like you mentioned, having anxiety is what is in your world. So being stoic about it and, and putting on a face and a facade, isn't that interesting that those words are so similar? Yeah. You put on a facade, and and then what's really at play is that anxiety. 
So no matter what you put out here, that's going to show up in your world because that's where you're coming from when you create. And yeah. so that that idea of control um, is is manipulating from that space. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's that I've got to make it do something. Whereas if you look at possibilities and acceptance, acceptance is just simply receiving willingly what is mm-hmm. to receive willingly. So I think of Viktor Frankl and when he talked about the concentration camps, he had his ideas before he went into his, the camps. The camps were a place to test out his theories. Right. And they were ac- they were accurate. And what he found is that no matter how much freedom is taken away from a person physically, they still have control of their attitude in any given set of uh, circumstances. And so he found that the people that survived the camps were the Mm -hmm. ones that had a purpose or created a purpose, meaning, and that's all made up. A purpose is a place to pause. It's just something to look forward to, right? Right. To where you'll rest. So when you find that purpose, it, it almost gives you something to work toward and it brings peace in the uncertainty. It brings peace in the unknown. What do you hear in that for you? Um, kind of going back to your salmon story, you know, it's like when we have when we're faced with things we can't control, we yeah. do change our attitudes and it's like, okay, well, I can't control, say hypothetically, being locked down or yeah. whatever. So we try to make the best of the situation. But at the same time, like the salmon, you're kind of stagnant, but you're waiting for that open opportunity to shoot forward. Yeah. So, and I think that in my opinion, that's what I think of is, is like when we're in a situation that we can't control, you know, we change our attitude, try to make the best of the situation of the things we can control, like our attitudes and things like yeah. that. But yeah. at the same time, you know, we're waiting for that opportunity to where we can just shoot upstream yeah. and then we can move forward. So when you're at peace, let's say that that, that situation is mm-hmm. salmonic, right? You're at peace mm-hmm. with the rushing waters around you. It empowers you so you get your brain back because when you're at peace, you're calm, your brain comes back into full function. When you're stressed, it shuts down because you're going into survival mode. It's just physiologically what occurs. And so when you're at peace, though, with what is, you're able to see possibilities and you're looking around you and, and you're looking for opportunities and possibilities in your world around you, even possibilities of new ways of thinking. Exactly. Because when yeah. you're in, in that fear state and that stressed out state, you're really closed off. You're not open to new ideas. You're not open to you're surviving. Yeah, I think survival mode and, and you know, like the anxiety of, of not being able to control a situation, we kind of close ourselves in and we're so focused on the problem instead of finding that peace, kind of stepping back and then being able to open your mind and be like, okay, let me kind of analyze this or, or, or to yeah. see what the situation is instead of, you know, being closed off, you know, because you can't control certain things. Yeah. So, and I think that's a lot of it is, you know, sometimes we have to take a step back, take a breath and then just see the situation for what it is and then find ways instead of just enclosing yourself because you can't do, you know, you don't have any control of what's going forward. Yeah. So I look at, you know, anxiety, I'll wake up some mornings with severe anxiety and and defining that as chemically in my body, I've got adrenaline going on. Right. Okay. Um, learning to just diffuse that. Well, here I am. I am where I am. Diffuse it. Well, there's anxiety. You give it a name even. Yeah. You know, there's Johnny Rocket, whatever you want to call it, right? Yeah. It's back. And then allowing space for it to be present because it is. Right. And then really you know, running toward it, not running away from it and re-engaging with your life. I mean, there's, there's power in that Barry McDonough and his work on anxiety. I think he's got a really powerful method for run for working through it, which is to diffuse it, to allow it to be present, to run toward it and to engage his dare. Right. Yeah. So when you're in a space of anxiety, I mean, it is what it is. There's no mask for that. It's, I mean, I feel anxious. So to re-engage from there with who you'd like to create yourself to be a more powerful person, a more empowered person is, is to not, somebody said, you know, like frosting dog shit. You don't want to do that. Right. Right. (laughs) So, cause that's what we do. We're anxious. And I loved it. It was from Steve Hardison. One of his followers said that. And, um, 
we we feel a certain way on the inside, but we mask it with something else. And then we bring that mask to the world when in reality, the internal stuff is out of alignment. Right. And so it's not a matter of pretending or faking it till you make it. It's being who you want to be back here, you right. know, so that yeah. that shows up out here. Yeah. I think a lot of, you know, and, and, and I don't mean any disrespect by this, but like, um, yeah, I think a lot of people, they, they think running from the problem is going to solve it. Um, mm. And I say this because uh, my oldest boy has uh, depression and anxiety. Yeah. And um, I see him try to run from the issue instead of like you were just saying, kind of, it is what it is. Let me, yeah. let me take it head on and let me figure out how I can change the situation or, or get some sort of control over it. Um, and I see him try to run from that all the time. And it just seems it makes, it makes it worse, um, in his situation. And it's kind of disheartening, obviously, you know, when you see your kids like that and you want to help them, I don't know how to help them. You know, I don't know how to reel him in or, or, you know, tell him, Hey, look, you know, you just got to do it head on. I don't know how he feels. I'm not trying to pretend I know how he feels. Yeah. So I just kind of see like. I mean, and I've seen it with other people, not just my son, but, you know, people try to run from the problem and really, no matter how hard it is, we have to kind of hit it head on and, you know, in order to move on. Otherwise, like you said, you're covering it and then, you know, the problem's still kind of behind you or, or your feelings and stuff are behind you and you're just kind of showing the world something else, but yeah, yeah it's still there behind you and that's not good for anybody. Let me, you know, the, the thought that came to mind, and I've got a quote I just pulled up while you were talking, um, is like a badger. If you've ever seen a badger take on a bear, yeah, it faces it head on. It's much smaller, much weaker, oh, yeah. but but its stance of facing the fear often will will result in that bear running away. Yeah. Um for for us, you know, Barry McDonough, this is one of his quotes. He says, as strange as it sounds, the greatest obstacle to healing your anxiety is you. You're the cure. In essence, you must learn to get comfortable in your anxious discomfort. The mm -hmm. secret to recovery, however, is that once you reach a point where you really allow and accept it, it begins to fall away and discharge naturally. Right. It just goes away. Like, yeah. And I'm a firm believer, you know, and I, and you've heard me say this before. Mindset is everything. Yeah. You know? and, and I'm not saying that's the cure, yeah. but it's a start of making ourselves better. And I had this conversation with my oldest son, you know, I, I see him go through things and I said, no one can fix you, but you, yeah. I said, I can sit here and give you all the advice that I've learned throughout my, you know, 48 years on this planet, yeah. but it ain't going to help you until you help yourself. And it's up to you to control your mindset. No one says you can't have emotions or you can't think certain ways, but you can't let it control you. That's the thing. Yeah. And I think for him and for a lot of people, they let the emotion control them and they get caught up in that. So, you know, I just had this conversation with him just, just the other day. You know, you have to, and controlling your mindset is a daily thing. I do it daily. That's what yeah. I do from my mindset. doesn't mean I'm not going to have a bad day or, I'm not going to have negative thoughts or this or that. I mean, nobody's a superhero. So it's like, you know, but it's a daily thing you have to do. You have to control that mindset every day. Yeah. So when you engage with that, you know, like the idea of mindset and who you're creating yourself to be in the world, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, it, it is a daily practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, there will be times that you go back to your automations, your unconsciousness, which we're designed to do if, you know, if we really look at it, we're designed to be automated so that we can do more things. The brain's phenomenal with that. Yeah. Um, but when we go unconscious into the old routines that are no longer useful, then we forget to create ourselves. And, mm -hmm. and the creation that we're creating will eventually become those automations. And so, but it does take that practice until it becomes automated. It, it, I don't know how many times it will take for you to make that a habit, you mm -hmm. know, uh, they say anywhere from 18 to 280 days to create a new habit somewhere in there up to yeah. a year. And it could even take longer. Some are lifelong that you're always having to be conscious about your choices and who you're being in the world, but who you're being. And I love that is who you're creating yourself to be is how you're going to show up in the world. And it's not masking. It's like, if you're being anxious, you're going to create stuff from that. Yeah. 
if you're being empowered, you're going to create stuff from that. So exactly. it, it really matters who you're being in here. Yeah. And like you said, it's a conscious effort every day. It's like you have to constantly think about it. I mean, I know, for example, I do, you know, I'm always uh, consciously, you know, listening to myself, like, what am I saying? Am I saying in a positive manner? Am I, am I, uh, yeah. um, you know, being a good leader for, for my employees? Um, am I being, am I having a positive atmosphere? Am I, am I raising morale by what I say? You yeah. know, be, and like I tell a lot of people is you can say the exact same thing, but you use two different tones and it could be perceived in two different ways, even though it's the exact same words. Right. Right. So like I said, we always have to be conscious of, of, what we say, how we say it, and who we're saying it to in order to uplift everybody. And I think that's what the world needs. You know, the world needs a lot of uplifting right now. So. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I posted a word, a single word. Somebody said, what if you could give your kids one thing? You know, I posted a single word, acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, the comments that came off of that single word were really interesting to me. It, it kind of just shares where people are at when they're responding, their way of listening. Yeah. And so we all have a, a listening, a way of hearing things. So when somebody says something, we hear it from where we're at, not from where they're at. We hear right. it from what we perceive. And so this single word created different results in different people. Some were very offended by it. It's a, it's a word. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's where looking at the world and stepping back and being Salmonic, being in a space of peace with what is really empowers you because somebody could say something, they could swear at you and call you every word in the book and it would have no impact. Mm -hmm. You would simply say, thank you for sharing. I'm glad to know how you perceive yeah. me. Right. But yep. who you're being inside may not align with what they see you as. Yeah. I mean, everybody's different and that's the thing. And, and the unfortunate thing that I've found, especially through what the world's been going through the last two years is that, we've lost respect for each other's opinions. Um, mm. We think that um, other people need to see views the way we see them. Right. And right. that's not how the world goes around. You know, the, what makes us individuals and what makes the world what it is, is the fact that we've all have a different a difference of opinion. Yeah. But the, yeah. But the key is to respect that. Like, and I've tried to teach my kids and, and even if I don't agree with somebody, I say, you know, I, I appreciate your opinion. You know, I mean, whether I agree or disagree. And if I disagree wholeheartedly, I'm not going to be angry at you. You're entitled to that opinion. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And then if I want you to listen to my opinion, I have to respect your opinion. That's the thing. And, and I see the majority of what's going on on social media and in the news and, you know, with the last two years, I think that's the hugest, one of the biggest problems. Yeah. The right. Making, yeah. And wrong, yeah. wrong making the, um, the I have the, the truth versus I have a version of my truth that I've created. Um, and, exactly. and that might hit people in, in the way it does. I don't, it's not mine to choose how people listen to this. Yeah. You know? So yeah, holding space to hear somebody where they're at and to have a model of understanding. And here's the distinction on understanding to understand something, to have knowledge of it enough to understand it. Um, Werner Earhart calls that the booby prize of life, mm -hmm. right? But to come to an understanding of another human to relate to where they're coming from when they say something is not that. So it's, it's not a booby prize. What that is, is a relating it's mm -hmm. okay. I see where you're coming from. And then from there, you can come to a solution together. Yeah, right? exactly. But we, we're not doing that. We're I'm right. You're wrong. It's the whole exactly. six and nine on the floor. It's like, my way is the right way. It's the mm -hmm. blind man and the elephant, that poem. And that's what's the unfortunate part is, you know, it's people just, I don't know. It's disheartening to be honest with you. I mean, I, I am a veteran. I fought for yep. the country and, you know, I was injured during my service and to come home and, and see how man. people are treating each other. It's yeah. just so unfortunate. And, and the fact is, is they need to understand that people are going to think differently and that's okay. You know, yeah. Just because yeah. they don't agree or see the views the way you do, it's okay. But if you want people to respect your opinions, you have to respect theirs. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's unfortunate, but I try to still project positivity. I mean, I've seen so many things, like you said, you know, you posted a word and it offended people. I see so much off offensive 
people being offended by just the most innocent things. It's, but it's what crazy. I love about what you're saying, John, is, is inside of you, inside of me, we have this opportunity. When you talk about opinions, we have judgments mm -hmm. and we have judgments about ourselves and others. And to hold space, like you're saying, for somebody else's views, their judgments, their opinions, um, doesn't mean that you have to take those on. It's just you have this space for that. You have mm -hmm. this grace for that. You have acceptance that that's how they view the world. And it's it's like telling a bear to not be a bear anymore or yeah. a salmon not to be a salmon. It's who they're being in the world. So like let them be a that that in the world you be who you are in the world and what i hear you being in the world is the best that you can be to, to hold exactly. space for others right to step into the unknown to create exactly and, and to and to uplift people and even if they don't agree with what you have i mean yeah the whole point of humanity is to is to excel each other and to lift each other up and and to continue right. to move forward and and I think a lot, a lot of people in the world have lost sight of that. And we're all human. We're all humanity. And yeah. the only way we're going to propel our future and make better futures for, for next generations is to lead by example. Yeah. yeah to, to be it right. To, to be, be that it. future. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, man, I, I love this. You know, as I look at the journey from the beginning of the show, even of, you know, where, where it ends up, you never know. It's like a tree. It branches out by for right. kids and goes. And, and that's the beauty of it. The whole thing as a whole is beautiful, but you look at in your personal journey. And I remember some of your journey here where you were really uncertain about finding a job and work and whether you stay in Vegas or move. And, and you were pretty open about that on online. Mm -hmm. And um, to see you move through that is inspirational because you feel that anxiety, you're battling old belief systems that say you can't show that, mm -hmm. but you're stepping into the world and being vulnerable about that, which brings it to the surface and allows space for you to grow. Um, you're looking for possibilities. You're able to secure a job and stay in the area, still looking at possibilities, but you're at peace with what is. There's some yeah. things out here, uncertainties in regard to the world. And, and you're working through those, you know? Yeah. And so it's, it's, um, we are humans. I'm going to say that, you know, we yeah. are humans and we're going to have affect and we're going to have emotions and attitudes and we're going to have beliefs and views and judgments because that's what humans do. And like you said, for the world to shift, uh, it's going to take each of us doing that work for ourselves. Like your son, no one is coming to rescue him. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like me, you know, I'm a yeah. prime example. I mean, I didn't have my parents help. Uh, I was cut off in life at 14 years old, forced to get a job and take care of myself, even though I still mm -hmm. lived at home, uh, mm -hmm. ended up homeless at one point. And, you know, I believe when catastrophic things happen in our life, we're faced with a fork in the road and you can either take the high path or the low path. You can, the low path being, you can use the situation as an excuse to be this particular person, or you can take the high path and be like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to take this and I'm going to have it motivate me to do better things. And that's the path I chose. Although I can say back then I wasn't conscious of that decision that I made. Yeah, yeah. I just happened to make it and it worked out for me that I didn't take the lower path where I was going to use what had happened to me as an excuse to either stay homeless or just to be a piece of, you know, piece of crap human being or whatever have you. Everybody yeah. has bad things that happen, but you know, we have to use it as motivation to become better and we can yeah, do yeah. it. And that's why I said, like, I was homeless. I was living in a church parking lot and now I'm here, you know, yeah, I, have a house, well, I, yeah. I have, you know, kids and, you know, all my kids are healthy and, you know, things are happening and, you know, nothing's certain, but you have to have that drive to keep going. Man, does it, okay. So if we look at the book as an example here, the giant's journey, is that a giant thing? what you've done. Of course. Yeah. I, yeah. I think so. I mean, you know, yeah. you, you've taken it upon yourself. You didn't wait for somebody to come rescue you. You took it upon yourself to rescue yourself and, right. and to move forward, you know, and that's the thing. And, and I share this story with my children so that way they can see that, you know, even though they think life is hard right now, like, Oh, I, you know, they're living at home, but they think life is hard. And I'm like, yeah. no, <laughs> I was like, life is hard when you have to find food, find shelter, 
I mean, there's people out there that always have it worse than you. And I know that, you know, yeah, but I, stay, yeah. I share my story. There's people that have had it worse than me, but right. I share my story in hopes to inspire people and motivate people to not succumb to their own uh, hard times and just stick in that circle, you know, stay in that, in that yeah. stagnant, you know, wallow, you know, bad things are going to happen throughout life, not yeah. just in one part of life, but like throughout life. And, you know, you just got to keep moving. I, I'd imagine, you know, if I had rewritten the story and he goes to see the giant and he says, I want to be a giant. Can you teach me how? And the giant just stretches him out. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like elastic man. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and it's like, oh yeah, that's how you become a giant. You're entitled to it. And, right. and a giant will just make you and save you and rescue you. And you'll just be a giant. Right. But, in the story, the reason it's written the way it is, is, is because he has to go back and grow into that. He has to go back and develop that just like you and me and just like your kids and everybody else. I didn't want my kids when I wrote that. I didn't want them to feel entitled, mm -hmm. not to anything. You're not entitled. Exactly. You, yeah. you get to go out and earn it and create it. And um, there's, there's really opportunity in the world right now for people to step into that is there's you are your rescuer. You are the person that's coming to change your life. Yeah. Research just a, keeps showing it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people are waiting for someone to, to rescue them. And, and like I said, you know, using my, my own son as an example, I, and I literally just had this talk like two days ago. Yeah. And I told him, I said, you know, ain't nobody coming. I mm -hmm. was like, it's up to you. I said, I can lead you. Like the old saying says, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make the horse drink the water. And yeah. it's the same with us human beings. I mean, we can be given all the advice in the world that if we used it could, pro could propel us to ultimate success. Right. But it's ultimately up to us to use that advice on our own self. Right. You know, it's like we have to listen and then make the change within ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, did it work? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> kids are kids are kids. He's only been trusted. So. <laughs> and I see my kids, my kids are older. My oldest just got married. I saw uh, that. And, That's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Uh, my 16 year old son, um, I didn't think he's listening at all. You know, I'll share stuff with him, but I try not to shove it down his throat. Right, yeah. You know, I just share and, and, uh, the kid's responsible, man. He's, he's taking on his own life. He's choosing okay. to do things for himself. He's, he's researching and looking into the world and how it works. I mean, he's sharing ideas with me. We did a video the other day on sondering. I hadn't even heard the term. He came up with that term. He's like, dad, have you heard of sondering? You know? Oh, and, wow. and so we talked about sondering and what that means, you know, to, to realize that every person has a complex life, just as complex as mine. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's out there wearing the brand. He's got giants and smalls on his shirts and, and be to do. That's and awesome. he's, he, it's not me saying, Hey, you need to wear this and take this out in the world. It's like, he right. loves the, the message and carries it on his own. My other kids too. That's awesome. Yeah. So just trust it. You know, when you're, when you're talking to your kids, they do hear it. They are developing. Um, yeah. Yeah. They, I, I think they do. It's just, I mean, we all go through it. I mean, I'm sure when we yeah. were young, like I know when I was young, I thought my parents didn't know nothing. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And then when I got older, I was like, Ooh, they were right. <laughs> oh, shoot. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they were like, on everything mom through. said was coming true. I was like, oh, yeah, crap. right. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome, man. Well, what else do you want to share today? Any other thoughts or I've enjoyed this. This is awesome. No, yeah, this is great, man. Um, you know, just uh, just be respectful, you know, like just a anybody listening, you know, everybody's going to have difference of opinion. And right now, I think one of the biggest things in the world, the world is facing right now is is the division of, of things going on. And, and we just need to accept each other for who we are for the yeah. individuals that we are and respect each other's opinions. If you want someone to hear you, you have to hear them. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. Well, man, thank you for being on the show. We'll go ahead and no, wrap I appreciate up having me. Yeah. For those that are watching in the comments there, if you ever want to be on the park bench, there's a link there. I've, I've reduced it to once a month at this point, maybe down the road, I'll do more. Um, but if you want to be on the park bench, park bunch, <laughs> become a benchy, <laughs> Uh, click the link and schedule and, and we'll get you on the, the show. And remember to go subscribe on YouTube. Thanks for being a part of this. Go make it a giant day and we'll see you in the next video. Awesome. Thanks.